Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Web Analytics, Tracking for Success Using Google Analytics and Google AdWords. I'm Tally Wells with the Atlanta Legal Aid Society, and I am excited to talk about this, uh, both because um, analytics has been an important tool, especially um, more recently as we've really um, come to understand it and worked with Namedia, um, who has done our analytics dashboard. Um, but I'm also excited because it's another chance to tell you a little bit about OlmsteadRights.org, which is our TIG-funded um, Olmsted website. And uh, presenting with me today is Mark Sherman of Namedia and Jillian Tile of Pro Bono Net. Here's a quick outline of our presentation. Um, I am a novice web creator. I had created one, only one other website um, prior to um, the OlmsteadRights.org website. And so um, I come to all of this very new, including analytics. And so I um, wanted to share with you the learned experiences we had in uh, using analytics for a new website uh, creator. And uh, then Mark Sherman from Namedia, and Namedia has been our fantastic um, analytics consultant and advisor and creator of our dashboard. Uh, we'll talk about the nuts and bolts of analytics. And then um, Jillian will talk about using analytics with Pro Bono Net. First of all, I will talk briefly about what is analytics, and Mark will get in much more depth. Um, this is my version of what analytics is. It essentially enables you to tra track who, when, how, where of your visitors, as well as much more. So who visited? What are the general demographics of the people who are visiting your website in terms of gender, age, uh, location, uh, when they visited? And then one of the most important uh, small pieces of information that I, th I think is really critical is how often and how long they visited. Are, are you only getting new time visitors? Is no one coming back to your website? Um, or are you getting a lot of repeat visitors? And then how long are they visiting? Uh, we've certainly gotten some people who visit only for a few seconds, click on uh, a link and then click away. Um, that's sort of great, but what's really interesting is when people come to our website and then um, really use the website. And then where are they visiting? What are the various pages that they're visiting? What are the links they're clicking on? What are they finding useful in the website so that we can respond to our audience based on the information that we glean as well as we can understand uh, what uh, ways of promoting the website are working uh, so that we can do more of the promotions that work and less of the ones that don't work. And there's much more um, that Mark will share about in a few minutes. We received a TIG grant um, at, uh, in 2014 for 2015 and, or for 2014 and 2015 uh, to build the OlmsteadRights.org website. And just to make sure everyone knows, Olmsted is the most important United States Supreme Court decision for people with disabilities held that people with disabilities have the right to live in the community and not in nursing homes and institutions. But not enough people know about Olmsted. So we, one of our purposes of the website was to tell the world about Olmsted. And certainly getting the word out about the website would be an important way to tell um, the world about Olmsted. So we wanted to build a website to tell the world about Olmsted, and then we wanted to tell the world about the website so they could learn about Olmsted. Uh, the second key part of this is um, enabling self-advocates. The, um, dis the disability community has a phrase called, nothing about us without us. It is essential to people with disabilities to have um, the right to make their own choices and to advocate for themselves. And we wanted to create tools and to also point people to tools that have already been created to do their own self-advocacy with respect to Olmsted. And then third, Olmsted is a U.S. Supreme Court case, but there's a lot of legal work that still needs to happen. And we wanted to create tools uh, for lawyers and um, law, law organizations, particularly legal services organizations and protection and advocacy organizations, be able to use to um, push Olmsted forward. We also applied for a Google AdWords grant, and one thing I can almost guarantee is that you will have an easier time obtaining a Google AdWords grant than we did. We did obtain it, but we had some 
special technical issues um, specifically that our website was uh, our, our Google contract was originally um, created as an EDU account for some reason, and that caused some issues as well as um, they had a different uh, email that had originally applied for Google AdWords that we could never track down, and Google would never tell us who had that email. So we, we took months and months working with Google to obtain the AdWords grant, and we, we did achieve that. And it, is, um, it definitely goes hand-in-hand -hand with analytics, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, I'll, talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about sort of what we were looking for with analytics, and then what we found um, once we actually started using analytics. So OlmstedRights.org, as I said, is a website with three main purposes, uh, but it has four main sections. In the upper left hand, um, you'll see the Olmstead decision. We have a whole section devoted to the history of Olmstead, about Olmstead. We have links to the um, Supreme Court arguments. We have um, the whole history of institutionalization in this country, and then um, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act's passage, what happened after the ADA, which Olmstead is based on, and then information about the case and what's happened since Olmstead. We wanted to be the resource for Olmstead, and I'm very proud that at least when I Google it and the, the places I go now, Olmstead is at the top or the top sort of that Olmstead Rights is um, the top of the sort of Google search for Olmstead. And I think that has something to do with the Google AdWords as well, although experts can tell us if I'm right. Um, we also have um, an I Am Olmstead section which tells stories of people whose lives have been changed by Olmstead. And this has been uh, a fantastic thing we've been able to promote through Facebook and Twitter, um, various stories of people whose lives have been impacted by the Olmstead decision. We have, as I said, the self-help tools section and the legal advocacy tools section. So we've built this wonderful website. We want to know who's coming and how often they're coming and where they're going. And um, we also want to see if social media, we're doing a lot of Facebook, a lot of Twitter. Are we just doing this uh, to, uh, for our own sake or are people um, actually using that to draw them to the website. And then now that we have the Google AdWords, uh, we want to um, use that to, to bring people in, and we really want to target our audiences and target how we're using Google AdWords. And then we've had a lot of events, and what events are drawing people to the website? And uh, Google Analytics is the best way that we know to figure out who's coming, how they're responding to everything that we're doing. So we launched uh, our website in June of 2014 at the exact um, same time as the 15th anniversary of Olmstead. So we had a big event at uh, the Carter Center in uh, the Carter, Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. We had the U.S. Justice Department in, uh, come down for it. We promoted it heavily um, through our social media. And um, we announced the launch of OlmstedRights.org at that event and also through Facebook, Twitter, and our blog. And um, Google Analytics is just a fantastic way to see, well, how did that work? Um, and then there's certain parts of our website we want people to especially visit, and we really want people to target people to come to. We have a membership part of our website for the legal tools, and we wanted to bring as many people who are our, on our side of Olmstead, uh, not necessarily the states who um, may contest lawsuits, but uh, legal services advocates and um, production advocacy organizations to join our website, see the uh, legal outline to um, use the various pleadings that we have as part of the website. So we want to know how, what we're doing that's right to draw people uh, to this and to join our website. We also have um, all these amazing resources. We've basically gone to all 50 states and um, linked all of the Olmstead resources in each of these states. 
And we want people now that we've built this to come and use all of the resources that we've spent so much time putting onto the website. And then third, we have a um, self-help or self-assessment tool that can then tell people how they can use Olmsted, Olmsted in their own life based on their situation. If they're in an, a nursing home and want to get out, if they're at home and they have a developmental disability, if they have a family member who has a developmental disability who's about to graduate from high school, how can they use Olmsted? And um, we have a self-assessment tool but that will then point them to the correct resources. And we definitely want to draw people to that section of the website. We, um, one of the things we also did is that for the 16th anniversary of Olmsted last month, we spent $200 in Facebook advertising. And um, we basically targeted um, our Facebook ads in two ways. One is all the people we have, um, just over 900 uh, people who like our Facebook page. So we wanted to target those people and their friends. And then we also wanted to target people who are specifically interested in disabilities. And then I guess actually there was a third group that we did, which was people who do disability law and um, tried to sort of move away from the Social Security disability folks and the, the larger um, ADA lawyers. And um, we ran a, a number of ads, and we saw an extraordinary impact. And the way we were able to see that impact was through uh, the Google Analytics. We went from about 200 people a week to over 2,500 people um, in a week visiting the website. And that traffic, while it's gone down, has continued partly because our Google AdWords started right after that. And uh, this is just a, a slide that shows you sort of how we targeted the Facebook advertisements. And then the other thing we did at the 16th anniversary was that we sent out a, an email from our litigation director to all the litigation directors of all the legal services organizations telling them about the 16th anniversary of Olmsted and encouraging them to join our legal tools section website. And while we we're very gratified by the number of people who came to our website through the Facebook advertising. It was this single email that really is what bumped up our membership for our legal tools section. And that, of course, didn't cost anything, but we were able to really measure that using Google Analytics. Finally, we, um, we did obtain the Google AdWords grant. It is a very simple application. It is not simple if there is a complication as we experienced. But um, Google AdWords uh, will give you um, the ability to uh, promote your organization, your website, um, through $10,000 a month in in-kind AdWords advertising. It is limited to $2 per click, and that is a major limitation as we've found so far, which is one of the reasons we're working with Namedia as part of our grant, because um, I went and created our first level of Google AdWords. These are some examples of our Google AdWords, but this is an actually, actually a week's uh, worth of advertising. We had um, 68 clicks and spend $109 at an average of $1.60, which means we're not going to come anywhere close. We'll come closer to $400 for, or $500 for a month rather than $10,000 because of the way we're creating the advertisements. Um, and so one of the, the, the critical lessons learned we've, we've learned about Google AdWords is that there is a science to actually drawing people to your website and being able to use the limit of $2 per click. And what that limit is is that you, um, there may be other people out there, for-profit organizations who are actually going to pay, and they'd be willing to take the same advertising space for $2.50, in which case, or per click, in which case we're not able to compete for that. We can only compete for those advertisements that are going to go under $2 per click. 
So all of this is a sort of a broad introduction of, of what we have done with OlmstedRights.org to give you a little bit of a taste of what are the, the sort of things that we were doing that we would then want to be able to track through Google Analytics. And I'm going to turn it over now to Mark, who is going to get much more in-depth into how to do Google Analytics and actually uh, use it in a productive way. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Sherman. I'm the president and uh, founder of Namedia. Uh, we've been doing uh, Google-related advertising and analytics for about 12 to uh, 12 years, and working with a range of B2B and uh, B2C type of uh, businesses. It's been really a pleasure to work with Tally and his team to uh, in this area of disability help with the OlmstedRights.org. Uh, what, what I'm going to try and do today is talk about uh, analytics from both a perfect world and a real world because as Tally alluded to, uh, there's always a few glitches in the real world, both in terms of building websites, getting them launched, and getting things like Google Grants set up and AdWords uh, working. Uh, in, in the ideal world, one of the things that we work, and this can work for a legal services organization as, regular, as well as for regular business, is really trying to identify the goals of the business. And uh, Tally and his team had identified some goals, which we'll talk about specifically. And then the, the key of that, and, and part of that as he described the website, is the getting the uh, lawyers to go through the legal advocacy side to get the self-advocates in, involved and in looking at the resources that are there. And so those, some of those goals are what we ended up tracking within analytics. Uh, but one of the other things that, and this is less analytics and more about how you design your sites and how you utilize your site, is to make sure that you're thinking about the goals when you're building the site and when you're building content on the site with what we call call to actions, things that will in motivate and incent someone. Uh, you visit a lot of websites and you can see where it says click here or, or join now or uh, sign up. Those are calls to actions and you want to make sure they're prominent so that people are motivated and can flow through your website to the place you want them to go. Uh, once you've got that kind of in place, then you can set up your web analytics to track those goals and then start working on trying to get traffic to the site. Uh, and then it's really a question of measuring to see how the users and the visitors are coming to the site, how they're engaging with the site, and then as you do that, the, the whole purpose of this, and my background is originally I was a manufacturing engineer, so this is very much like uh, continuous improvement, is that you're going to adjust the design, continue to measure, tweak some things, tweak your advertising, treat, tweak your uh, content, uh, add more pages, and kind of see if you're getting better qualified people, uh, and if you are, are they engaging more on the site. That's ultimately the goal. One of the things that we tell a lot of uh, clients too, and I think is very true in this case, especially when you're dealing as we get into specifics about Google Grant, is this is really about noise reduction. One of the, the misconceptions that a lot of people have in the uh, internet and websites is that all traffic is good traffic, and that is completely false. And that's one of the things that Google Analytics can help you understand is are you getting the right type of traffic? Because the worst thing that can happen is for you to show up for something that is very broad and is no longer uh, relevant to you, and, and so you get a lot of traffic, but they don't engage with your site. One example is we work with a client that was in the uh, rugged computer uh, business, and uh, they actually had one of the first uh, tablet computers out in the marketplace. That was great until the iPad hit, and then once the iPad hit, they got lots of traffic, but it was all for consumers looking for a ta an iPad tablet or an Android tablet, not for someone looking for a rugged tablet. And so they're having to redesign their whole site to kind of cut down the noise and focus on things like that. So that's really the only way you can tell that is by looking at several metrics that are there and continuing to adjust and adapt your site as the nature of Google changes. Google changes all the time, uh, and uh, the whole way people access websites uh, changes. Uh, the shift to mobile that's happened in the last three years that's been hugely significant is one of those things that a lot of companies have been kind of caught uh, behind on and are having to adjust uh, their websites to adapt to that new reality. And Google Analytics can help you definitely understand what that uh, priority is. Uh, again, in the perfect world, 
uh, you would design your website understanding specifically who your users are and what your site objectives are. Uh, make sure that your content, and this is really one of the key things, especially in the legal, legal services area that you have to be careful of, is there's a whole lot of lawyer speak and then there's consumer speak. And one of the things that you have to do, and uh, you can call it dumbing it down, but it's really trying to match the terminology on your website to the terminology people use to search for those type of topics. Uh, if you use a lot of legal terms, you're going to get a lot more lawyers there. So again, on the promotion of the legal advocacy section of the site, that can be used in, in, to a benefit. But when you're talking about the self-advocates who may be less inclined to use uh, or know the particular legal terms, then you're going to want to use general, uh, much broader terms that are uh, relevant for, for those uh, people to be able to find you and that Google would match to that. And then you obviously have the call to action to engage them. So the real world, what happens is uh, sites typically are developed by uh, somebody that has been contracted or self-designed or has some design background or is a developer. And what we have found, uh, especially in the uh, kind of nonprofit uh, where people offer to do things free and also in the small business world, is a lot of people will hire a designer or a developer, but they don't really have a clear objective for their site. Calls to actions are missing. It's not really optimized for search engine optimization. And so what happens is a lot of work goes into launching a great site. Uh, and then the site basically doesn't perform because a lot of the things have not been dealt with. And so one of the things that becomes very key in what we were involved with with Olmstead Rights is we audited their site and kind of made recommendations to improve the usability, the engagement, and the goal tracking. Now, the Tally and his team are always very busy, and so they've got the list, and they're slowly working on things to be able to update the site on, uh, but that's a continuous process that you continue have to look and evaluate what's going on, and are you engaging people in that, and I'll show you some statistics here in a second. Uh, and then always, and this is a big, big thing for us, is to set up your uh, Google Analytics, and there's something, a product called Google Tag Manager, which is uh, basically a container box that you can add certain things into. Google has a lot of power, and one of the things that uh, Jillian will talk about with ProBono.net uh, is that uh, they have a kind of a standard uh, content management system to enable to track sp certain specific things on the site. Google Tag Manager may be an item that you need to include uh, on your site to be able to go in and look at a particular video and track its usage and things like that because there you can go in and identify specific uh, uh, HTML uh, elements and, and say you want to track clicks or engagements or things like that. Uh, so that kind of helps you get more insight, especially if you have a page with a lot of media or interactive JavaScript type of uh, stuff going on on the page that won't show up in a page view. And that's one of the things that Google Tag Manager can be very beneficial to, to help you do, uh, especially on a centralized CMS like ProBono.net. Uh, so, so we've got a question here from David which is how do you conceive of a call to action if the mission of the site is education or transfer of information, kind of possibly uh, find, finding and reading the content is the goal? Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, so one of the things that you can do, again, with Tag Manager, what we do is sometimes we'll uh, implement, uh, if it's a long article, is we can actually track how far down a page uh, somebody has scrolled. Uh, so that's one of the things that you can measure and set that up as a goal. Uh, the other type of thing, which especially on the informational educational side, is getting them to view more and more pages. Because if your mission is truly to educate, then what you want to do is to make sure that there's a lot of page views per session that are occurring. So each time a, a person visits the site, they're not just looking at one or two pages, they're looking at five or ten pages. So sometimes Sometimes we create goals that basically say we want to track to see how many users hit at least five pages or spent six minutes on the site. That's one of the things that uh, is, is very key. And then the call to actions is to just make sure that they don't get to the end of a page 
and stop and not know where to go. So one of the things that uh, we work with clients now is to come up with a sticky nav so the header is always at the top or there's some button or something at the bottom of an article that will let them go out and, and see something else or make sure you have side bar material that is relevant and related to the content that they're looking at. So if you're talking about a particular uh, law, as an example, uh, there may be a case study or a, uh, a story like on Olmstead rights where there, there are stories, you can basically have a sidebar that says, here's an example of a, a person that went through this situation and here's a, a personal vignette on that. So those are the type of things that you'd want to do is to basically make sure you're not just doing a data dump, so to speak, of legal or other type of information, but it's also telling them what steps do they need to do next, how do they get empowered, and how do they uh, basically begin to use that information. Uh, again, going back on the presentation, the, the key step that on the first part is, is identifying the goals. And we kind of call goals as measurable web-based uh, uh, actions that can be aligned with the goals of the organization. So we really want to know, are they accomplishing what it is? So again, in uh, Tally's perspective with Olmstead rights, one of the things was, are they looking at the resources related to the states? And so we set that up as a goal. Uh, so the four goals that were uh, set up by on Olmstead were joining the Olmstead rights, uh, that getting in and getting their emails in there. Uh, resources in your state clicks, so people actually drove down into the state areas and looked at different resources. How many files that were downloaded? Again, this is a really good one, especially with the type of legal information you have, is you can create PDFs uh, that have that in a more condensed fashion and are formatted correctly. Uh, sometimes printing out websites is not a very pretty uh, action, so having a very good crisp PDF document, but not necessarily making it a page, but it having a process that they can go download that document uh, allows you to track to see which documents are of interest, how many got engaged, and how many got downloaded. And then if people send and click on an email to send an email, we can track that and see how that's going. So those were the kind of the, the four goals that we looked at within the Olmstead Right site. Uh, so the, the key on the integration of the site is most cases the goals aren't integrated into the design. Uh, so you've got to kind of go back and look at this. And, and one of the things that we step back on is make sure you know what your site's trying to accomplish. And I've just listed some examples of what people use site for. If it's a business card site and all you're trying to do is look like you're real, then that's just going to show up there. Uh, designers and, and fashion and stuff like use what we call eye candy sites, which are just visually very stimulating, great for a brand. They really don't care to sell anything. They just want to show you a picture. Uh, a, a site like Olmstead that's informative and educational, you really got to make sure you've got enough content and people can easily find that content and navigate through that content. So one of the things that you can do, as an example with Google Analytics, is you can tie a search uh, query and track that search query so you can begin to see the type of words that people are actually on your site looking for, what type of resources, and that can help you, again, move some content up to the front and push some content down uh, that is less informational or, or less Im important to people. Uh, but regardless of what state your site is or where you're at, uh, the strongest thing that we would recommend out of this is make sure you've got Google Analytics set up and start tracking what's actually happening. You don't have to go blow everything up and, and, and do things and start from scratch. Just see what's happening and then start seeing what little tweaks you can do to kind of improve the functionality of the site and see if that improves engagements and goals. Uh, to set up uh, the tracking, uh, again, there's kind of four steps that you, you go through. One is installing Google Analytics, and uh, Jillian will talk a little bit about how ProBono.net can help uh, facilitate that. Uh, we recommend installing Tag Manager, again, because you can track more things like scrolling down to a bottom of of a page and, and other type of media engagement elements that are uh, less likely to be able to do in a, in a standard CMS. Uh, installing Google Webmaster Tools, it's now called Search Console 2 Console, but if you search for Google Webmaster Tools, you'll see what it is. But Google, once you have analytics and, and you, if you install the Google Webmaster Tools and associate those two onto Google Analytics, you can actually see what keywords you're showing up for what on Google 
uh, organic searches, uh, what devices you show up for, how many pages you have indexed on a site. It has a whole host of information that's very informative to see how well your site is being found naturally uh, through the normal Google algorithms. Uh, and then obviously instrumenting the goal completion and tracking uh, within Google Analytics is, is the other part of that. Uh, Again, within ProBono.net, because it's a centralized CMS that uh, a lot of different organizations use, there's a, a few other steps, and Law Help and Open Advocate and custom sites may require some specialized implementation help. But typically what happens is you'll put uh, the container for Google Analytics or Tag Manager into the header or right uh, before at the beginning of the body tag so that it appears on every page. Uh, and that basically connects it to the analytics, and then you can go into the, the dashboard and see that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time specifically on navigating Google Analytics. Uh, we don't have enough time to do that in this. What we're going to do is really talk through uh, some dashboards and measurements. And so assuming that you've got that all set up, uh, you want to get traffic, which is real people visiting websites. Uh, one of the terminologies that has changed in the past few years is there used to be called uh, within analytics that used to be called visitors. They're now called users. Google has done a lot of changes where they actually track a user across multiple devices. For example, if you're logged into Google Chrome uh, or on, uh, you use Google a lot and you sign in with your Gmail account, uh, you can switch from a phone to a desktop to a laptop. If you're lo logged in the same way, they recognize now that you're a single user, and that is reflected in analytics. So you can get a much better uh, view of what a user is. A few years ago, it used to be a user was anyone that came in from any device. So if I came in from a laptop or a smartphone or a desktop, I would be considered three separate people. There's still some of that that exists, uh, but it's getting less and less, and, and they're doing a lot to clean that up. But you can see where people come from, Google being Twitter, uh, Facebook, any advertising you do and things like that. There is one uh, thing that I just caution people on, and this beca has become a much bigger problem in the last year. There are a lot of uh, rogue uh, uh, SEO and, and vendors that are out on the Internet. It's still a little bit of a wild west, but they figured out ways to basically take your analytics ID and message it. So you'll see referrals from sites like Button for Websites, SEM Alt, Videos for Your Business, uh, a bunch of those. Uh, and and we'll basically, those are spam and, and there's a way to filter them out in Google Analytics and you gotta have to just continue to look at those to get those out because what will happen is those will inflate your traffic so you will think you're doing a lot better but your engagement rates will go down because these typically don't engage with your site at all. So you want to get those out of the mix, and that's, that's something very key. Uh, there's a question that's uh, out there. My average session duration is about half the average time on page. What does that mean? The key with uh, the difference between session and page, so session is when a person comes in uh, and the, from the time they bring up your site in their browser, to the time they leave your site in that browser, that's considered a session. If they don't click on anything, uh, they basically bounce. Uh, if they stay on the first page and don't engage and they hit the back button or go somewhere else, that's considered a bounce and they leave the site. Uh, and in that case, they would have one page per session. If they visit multiple pages, uh, they will basically have multiple pages per session. What happens from a timing point of view is the average session duration is the time that it takes uh, across all the different users, the average amount of time that they have spent on your site. Now what is uh, key about that is it's a little distorted from the point of view that if somebody leaves and bounces on your site but spent five minutes but didn't engage with your site at anything on that one page, they would be considered a, a zero second visit. So it's really the only way you know how long a person has been on a page is after they move to the next page. So when you look at average time on pages, that's really people that have viewed multiple pages and how long they actually spend on the page. So totality-wise, if you were to look at how many pages you had and how many average sessions, uh, then you could do the math and they would be pretty close to uh, the total of number of pages times the average 
time per page should equal all the number of visitors and the average sessions on whatever period that you're looking at. Uh, I want to talk briefly before we get into the metrics because uh, you'll start to see some of this again on the Google Ad Grant. Uh, Tally talked about this. It's $10,000 a month of free advertising. People type in the relevant search queries and a nonprofit can show up and you can click. Uh, and there's some limitations apply. Uh, I don't think they take religious organizations uh, and they have some other criteria. Uh, the example of what that looks like in here I've typed in disability housing legal assistance uh, and you can see all the different uh, results. These are all what are considered organic. These are the ads. Sometimes there's three ads that appear at the top, uh, but each one of these they are paying on a per click basis. So James Morgan attorney is bidding and is willing to pay some amount of money. Uh, within the Google grants, you're restricted to $2. So that may mean that you're down here or even uh, further down. The, in some cases for legal things, we were looking at a, another attorney's sites and we saw uh, some keywords that were as high as $150, you know, when they're looking for a DUI representation or something like that. So it can get very expensive, specifically within the legal category. What's cool about the Google Grants, and this becomes a real key part of the strategy, is you have access to a tool within AdWords called Keyword Planner where you can put in keywords, you can put in geographies, you can put in a lot of things, and Google will suggest up to 800 terms and AdWord categories that they can, would recommend that would hit that criteria. One of the things that is very key within internet marketing, specifically on search marketing, is to use what is called the long tail. So if you use the word attorney or lawyer, I can almost guarantee you those are going to be 10 to $100 words because you have basic attorneys that are trying to win clients on that. If you deal with legal help or free legal help, things like that, you're going to have a much better chance to be able to compete uh, with advertising and draw traffic to that. So the ads will get you here. Ideally, if your site is well constructed, kind of as Tally was talking about with Olmstead rights, uh, you will end up showing up here in the free organic searches, and that's the organic side versus the ad side. Google Grant will help you on the ad side and help you build, build the brand awareness. To give you some example of the, the keyword planner on this, we look for disability-related keywords, uh, and they, Google said that there's about 250,000 searches a day in the U.S., which means that you could easily spend $1,500 to $1,800 a day generating somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 uh, clicks uh, with a $2 click. And you can see some of the terms in here uh, and the maximum CPC that was put in. And this gives you an idea of what percentage of people do, what your average position would be. Uh, and this is very helpful for two things. Number one, for targeting uh, using the Google ad uh, grant, uh, number one. But number two is these are also the type of keywords that you're going to want to include in your content. Uh, as you're going through whatever type of legal service uh, area that you're supporting. Uh, I also went and looked at this for just general free legal services. Again, trying to see what type of opportunities there were for uh, all of those uh, that are in the legal advocacy area. And it turns out there's 2.5 million searches a month uh, in the U.S. for free legal services, pro bono lawyer, uh, legal services or related terms. Uh, so there's a ton of opportunity there to get traffic uh, with a Google Ad Grant. A key is obviously getting it down to uh, your, uh, you know, whether you're a family services type of uh, service, a housing, uh, whichever type of uh, service, advocacy or service you're promoting. Uh, the other type of thing, and this just kind of gives you an idea of, of the power of keywords, when we were working with Tally in the Olmstead Rights uh, site, uh, we have a mechanism where we spider the site for all the pages and see what type of words pop out. And so you can see that Olmstead, obviously being uh, the focus, is the biggest, uh, most searched for volume. Uh, the, the size of the words here is the frequency of those terms on their site. So disability and advocacy and legal services. So their site is very well structured around disability advocacy uh, and the Olmstead rights. So they have that. And then the lower, smaller words here are the type of things that become important. So things like 
page uh, is not a very important keyword, but people with disabilities is very key. And then you're trying to match your site and the page content to what people are searching for. This helps not only on the organic side, it also helps when you match the keywords you're advertising to, to the landing page or the page that you're sending those ads to and the content of that ad. So that's all, it's a, again, complicated process, but the key message that you should walk away with is, is make sure you're speaking the language that people are searching uh, for whatever type of advocacy you're trying to do in those type of areas. So once you've got that going and you've got traffic coming, uh, you, it's really about measuring the traffic and the goals uh, and basically who's coming to your site, uh, what are they going to do, and what we're going to do is we created uh, six dashboards, and I'll show you some of those uh, for uh, Tally and his organization to be able to review. Uh, a couple of key definitions as we go into this. So a session is the group of interactions that when you come visit in a browser within one time frame. Once you leave the site, uh, if you don't go back to it within 30 seconds, uh, it's considered a session. Uh, the second piece is users are the metrics of the unique people. Again, it could be devices or it could be people. It used to be only devices. Now it's a combination of people on multiple devices, but it's still a little bit of a gray area. So don't, if you get 1,000 users, that may actually mean more like 700 users and some people on multiple devices. But again, as long as you recognize that, it gives you an idea and what you're really looking for is relative change and relative engagement and how many people are either sending you emails or joining your organization or trying to ask questions of your organization. And then bounce rate is the percentage, as I mentioned earlier, of single page sessions. The key thing, again, that we're focused here on uh, in this presentation within analytics is to talk about goal conversion uh, and goal completion. So conversion is when a user comes to your site and actually does something that you intended them to do. So in the case of Olmstead, that could be uh, signing up for Olmstead rights. It could be clicking on a state resource page. It could be downloading a document or it could be emailing them. Uh, and those are the type of goals that we set up for them. But that's really what we're looking. So conversion rate is how many of those, those goals actually happen divided by the total number of users. Uh, and you can do that individually by goal or for all your goals combined. Uh, the visitor dashboard uh, that is the, the, what you see on the screen right now is really focused on, we took the uh, June 2015, and so you can see the number of sessions. So they had about 3,700 sessions, uh, 3,200 unique visitors. So those were unique devices or individuals that could be ascertained. We can see where they're coming from. So predominantly the U.S. Uh, you can see that the Canadians, uh, they, the 33 that came, 91% uh, of them left as soon as they realized it wasn't about Canada. Uh, so that's the type of thing you can see. We can also see how many are new visitors. So 14% were returning visitors. So that's something that's going to grow as the site gets more engagement on it. Uh, and then what cities are coming from. So a lot of interest. So the not set that you see here is probably due to some of the spam that's coming in. Uh, typically, you, you're going to have, if people come in from a desktop or from a, a mobile phone or a tablet, their IP will resolve to some city. Uh, again, if they're working for a major firm and they have multiple offices and a centralized IT organization, they may be coming in from uh, New York, but their office may be in Boston, uh, as an example, because their network is routing through New York. But that, uh, there's no way you can get around that unless they come in on their mobile phone. Uh, so you can see how many visitors. What's interesting here is you can see which cities now drive uh, the, the most engagement. So New York had the lowest bounce rate, uh, and then Atlanta, and then Seattle. Uh, you had higher bounce rates in Washington, Chicago, uh, and in San Francisco. So there may be some content specific to those areas that you want to get to be better, or they're not clear how to get to the information. Uh, so again, the overall site bounce rate was 76 which percent, which means that of everyone that came, 76% of the people left after visiting the first page. Uh, in most cases, they came in through the home page. There were 1.8 pages per session, uh, and 
one minute and 17 seconds was the average length of duration. Again, that's the high level thing. What's interesting is when you look at what we call non-bounce rate uh, visitors, and that looks at those 24% or 23% that didn't bounce, you're going to see that their engagement rate was uh, significantly higher, uh, and, and those are the guys that you really care about and you want to navigate your site around. Uh, second dashboard that we have here is where are they coming from. So the first dashboard was how many are coming. The second dashboard is where are they coming from. So in this case, again, for June, we can see that uh, Facebook had a lot of referrals uh, which was based on the $200 that uh, Tally had mentioned that he had spent. Uh, so that was their largest referral source and drove 1,500 sessions. Uh, unfortunately, only one person in Facebook uh, actually engaged uh, with one of the goals. Direct, the people that came to the site by typing in olmsteadrights.org, uh, 817 came and 49 of them completed the goal. Typically, when you see direct uh, those are people that know something about your site, and you're probably going to have a much higher uh, goal completion rate for those uh, than you would for someone coming from social media. Social media is less task-oriented, so it's great for creating awareness. It's not as good for creating engagement. Uh, but what happens is once you've created awareness, then people may remember your site and go to that site or then Google it and find that site later. Uh, so this kind of gives you a perspective. So social media in June drove 70% of their traffic. Direct traffic was 21%. Organic traffic was 6%. Now, to be honest. Mark? Yes. Hey, this is Tally. I'll, I'll just say one thing quickly on the, the lower referrals that have the, num the lower numbers on the Facebook under the sessions and goals. Yeah. Those were the ones that I referred people to the self-help section and to the legal tools section. So this actually shows me that sort of the, the general um, Facebook ad that I did that celebrated the 15th anniversary and told people to go look at our, our single page on the history of Olmstead got a lot of people, but they didn't do anything other than that. But when I referred them to the specific pages on self-help and legal tools, while well, we had all fewer visitors, we had much higher uh, completion. Yeah, and that's a great point, Tally. The other point that I would say here is if you look at the MDOT Facebook, that's Facebook's mobile. Uh, Facebook.com is their desktop. Uh, the other issue is that, again, because of almost 80% of the people use Facebook on their mobile phones, uh, again, just to browse the time, spend time checking up with people. So when they saw that ad, they clicked on it, saw the page, came, and they didn't really do anything. But the desktop people were much more engaged uh, and then, as Tally said, some of these that were much more targeted, uh, they came in engaged. But again, M dot, uh, Facebook is, uh, LM dot is their mobile thing. So one of the things that this would tell us is that focusing on that mobile engagement becomes one of the, the key things to try and do. But the, the other point I was going to say here is on organic search. So typically, and, and to put this in perspective of what the power is, that if you have your site done well and focused on matching keywords to what people are searching for, most customers get around 40% of their traffic uh, from organic search. Uh, so that's a huge, huge opportunity. And what we've done with some clients is uh, you can start with uh, like the Google AdWords grant and get that where it may start off that 80% of your search traffic comes from paid and then over time, as you use that data, you can improve your organic rankings, and slowly that increases. In fact, we did this with a client of ours, and when they started, it was 80% paid, 20% organic, and by the time uh, after three years, it was 80% organic and 20% paid, and the, the paid stayed pretty constant. Uh, so that kind of shows you the power of using this to just increase your overall visibility from an organic optimization perspective, too. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about the goals uh, on this. And so they had 91 goal completions, uh, which, again, for this was really just set up, and so this was great uh, insight. And so 35 of those goals, people joined the Olmstead rights. Uh, so that's getting into the advocacy side, which is something that he was saying. And I think Tally mentioned most of these came in uh, through the email uh, that they were promoting. Uh, then they had these. Events were resources 
that people were uh, looking at in your state. Uh, and then we can see, and this is one of the things that becomes really key when you look at conversion rate by channel, is we can see that the organic people, even though we said that organic was only driving about 20% uh, uh, of the uh, traffic, it has a much higher conversion rate uh, than the social media did at 1%. So there's kind of the trade-off is the quality of the traffic. What we typically find is that social media drives around 2 to 5% of traffic to a site in general. Uh, that typically isn't very engaging. It's great for branding and awareness creation. But when people are become task-oriented, they go to a search engine like Google, type in the terms, and come directly on there. What's also fascinating here is that you can see that the conversion rate for organic search is higher than the conversion rate for direct, which says that can be a great place to leverage the Google grant money that they just got to go in and target those people and try and get that high conversion rate with more and more visitors. So they may not be able to spend all $10,000, but the more they can spend on that, which is basically money that Google is giving them, uh, they can go in and, and get a much broader advocacy pool created and get people engaged. Uh, and this, this is kind of a, a sample of uh, goal analysis that I put together. It's, it's pretty small and I recognize that. But what we just wanted to show you that this compares July 1st uh, through July 27th to the previous period. That's one of the powers that you can do within Google Analytics. So we just wanted to kind of see what happens. This big spike you see in the orange here is when Tally ran his $200 uh, uh, Facebook promotion. So that drove a lot of promotion. But what's interesting here is you can see that while traffic has dropped from 3,700 visitors in June to 895, bounce rate, paid sessions, and average session duration have increased significantly, 18%, uh, 14%, and 47%. Uh, once the social media went down. When I look at the social media side of this channel, you can see that social media dropped by 95%, uh, but the people that came were much more engaged. And this goes back to the point I was talking about, which is quality of traffic versus quantity of traffic. You really want to try and drive quality traffic. And here you can see that organically they've gained 26% of their uh, traffic just over a month, and those people have engaged much more appropriately and have a much higher conversion rate, so their conversion rate went up 24% just in one month by basically having a much more targeted uh, audience coming in through that organic source. And that's the type of thing that you're going to do when we talk about rinse and repeat, is you're going to look at this stuff on a month-to-month, week-over-week type of basis, depending on seasonality and things like that, but you're going to see what am I – what are the numbers telling me that I need to do? So if I just looked at this from a session's point of view, I would freak out and say, oh my goodness, it was awful. We had 76% less traffic. But when I look at it from a goal conversion point of view, I sit there and I say, but I had much better engaged traffic, so now I have to look around my channels to see what do I need to do to basically increase the promotion uh, of those and get more visitors from the channels that work the best for me. Uh, so again, once you've got that in and you've got those dashboards measuring it, it's a question of adjusting uh, the design, adapting to that, and building more landing pages or uh, targeting keywords and adjusting the content so that you're mapping that into what people are looking for. Uh, again, then it's really a process of rinse and repeat. Periodically review the goals of your business. Are they still the same goals? Are you accomplishing those goals? Are they being reflected in the site design? Do you need to add more content? Do you need to add more goals? Do you need to add more engagement points? Uh, confirm that you're tracking. Explore ways to acquire the different traffic as to that example that I just showed you. And then monitor the goal and adjust and design to basically improve that. Uh, one of the things that obviously we're uh, one of 200 worldwide Google Analytics certified partners. Uh, this stuff can get very, very complicated. Uh, you can definitely do it yourself. Uh, it just takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, one of the things that's happened with analytics over the past few years is Google has uh, literally made it a free, world-class 
uh, analytics platform, uh, and enterprises use it and actually pay a lot of money for it. So they've added a tremendous amount of functionality to it. Uh, a lot of that functionality you're probably not going to need, but the key is to make sure that you've got filters in place so that you're measuring the right traffic and you're not getting spam, that you're getting the right goals in place, that you're measuring the right type of events on the site. And that's something that we can help you set up uh, or uh, anyone else could do and go in and basically set that up. And once it's set up, uh, you can basically run it on, on your own and use that to measure and monitor and then use a consultant to basically, if you have any questions or, or unique issues that you want to try and address. And then on the other side, on the Google Ad Grant, uh, you know, one of the things, and, and we've worked with several nonprofits uh, with the Google Ad Grant, uh, the tendency is always to start and try and do it yourself. Uh, it's $10,000. If you don't do it well, uh, I have another client that we, we're starting to work with. He had the Google Grant for 14 months, and he spent a total, whopping total of $4 in that 14 months because he didn't get help. Uh, it's very easy to say you have it, but if you're not using that free money, you're not increasing the awareness of the advocacy that you're trying to promote. And so that's one thing. And Don't let it just sit there. Mark, if I could just interrupt, and um, unsolicited saying the media has been fantastic and um, has sort of exceeded every expectation we had. So I'll just throw that little plug in from the media. Thank you. And again, we're happy to help uh, anyone that needs help to, to do it. And we can, you know, kind of evaluate your situation and see what it takes to do it and either give you advice and counsel or partner with you to, to basically make that happen. We're, we're happy to do that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Jillian. So thanks, thanks, Mark, um, for your really great presentation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit. Um, so as Tali and Mark have mentioned, Olmsted Rights was built on the Pro Bono Net platform. And um, as most programs know, Pro Bono Net uh, has developed an extensive uh, system of uh, custom reports for pro bono net sites, which are generated monthly, quarterly, and annually, and are available in the admin inbox of the sites. Um, and while we, we do not currently manage Google Analytics on behalf of the pro bono net network the way that we do for lawhelp.org sites, um, we can certainly add partner supplied tracking code to help support the use of Google Analytics in the same way that Olmsted Rights did um, in, in working with the media. Um, so here's some information that we would need from you to to implement this, and again, this is for folks on the Pro Bono Net platform. Um, so we would need the meta tag information for Google Webmaster Tools um, and the Google Tag Manager snippet provided to us. Um, our preference also is to make sure to use the Google, the Universal Analytics versions of these tools as Google Analytics is switching over um, to Universal Analytics. Um, so we ask that that be done proactively um, uh, just to, to make sure that since Google is transitioning over, uh, we have the most updated version of the code. Um, this so process a quick question before we get uh, too far. Um, one was, um, what does uh, new media charge or, or more generally, what should individuals be looking at when they're looking to contract with someone? Uh, for help in this area? So that's, that's a great question. I was going to uh, type that in to uh, answer, but uh, our rates are uh, around $125 to $150 an hour, depending on uh, the situation. Uh, a typical analytics setup uh, for a basic site, uh, again, we've had the experience with ProVono.net, so we know what to do with Jillian on that. Uh, always a learning curve, but you're, you're, you're probably going to be in the neighborhood of uh, around $750, so, you know, you're looking at four to five hours uh, to, to basically go in and configure something like that. Uh, you know, there, we do audits uh, to evaluate a website to see how well it is organically and things like that, so those things can go all over the place. But, uh, you know, a, a, a base engagement, uh, you know, could be in the 750 to a couple thousand dollar range. Thanks. I'm sorry, Jillian. You're oh, 
Oh, okay. Um, so uh, as as I was saying, um, the process may be similar if you're on Open Advocate or working with another um, content management system provider. Um, we ask also um, for ProvoneNet, if you're providing us with this information, um, just plan for 10 business days um, for us to make sure that we have that information on the site. Usually it goes a little bit quicker, but we just ask um, for that extra lead time. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about um, some uh, a, a project uh, that is dealing with uh, Google Analytics. It's a um, it's a law help analytics tag with the Northwest Justice Project. Uh, so the goal of this project is to provide, and again, this is specific to the law help, our lawhelp.org partners, but it's to provide our lawhelp.org partners with a more robust set of tools to analyze the rich body of statewide website usage. And these tools will provide valuable information to, as Tally was talking about in the beginning, um, to evaluate and guide content development priorities and outreach strategies, and to also help programs better capture the impact of their law help sites for funders and other stakeholders. And we will be working with NJP to share the project outcomes and replicable dashboards with the statewide website community at large uh, later this year and in early 2016, so this may be of interest um, to those on this call. Um, so part of this grant is going to be working to expand support for universal analytics on lawhelp.org sites and to, as I mentioned, develop a set of um, dashboards uh, for the community in universal analytics and then to le leverage the universal analytics and law help API to automate certain types of custom reports that are currently uh, need to be generated on request by pro bono net. Um, one other resource just want to throw out for the uh, legal tech community is that we do have a um, Google Analytics toolkit that uh, we developed for the law help community as a helpful resource for um, understanding Google Analytics in the law help context. As Mark mentioned, uh, this can be, uh, Google Analytics can be pretty daunting. It's a very robust tool. Um, so uh, it's, it's a good place if you um, just want to get a very basic sense of how analytics works um, in that context. Um, could even be useful for other programs as well, but I will push a link out to that um, if, if you'd like to use that as a resource. Jillian, uh, just, uh, this is Mark, to, just to follow up on that. Uh, it can be overwhelming, but I would say don't let it scare you. Pick. Uh, pick a couple of things to focus on and, and learn what that means and how it's doing. There's a lot of resources out there where people describe what the different metrics and things mean. So again, don't let that stop you because there is a ton of functionality, but once you learn kind of the basics of what is important to you to start, that's a great place to start and just encourage people to get started and make sure you're using it uh, and then grow as you grow with the system. That's great advice. All right, and so I think um, that that was the end of my presentation. Um, so I'll turn it, um, I think now we're just opening up for questions, but I'll turn it over to Tally and Brian if there's any last words. Well, I'll just say, Jillian, how grateful I am to Pro Bono Net and to you in particular for all the ways you've worked with us because we've had a lot of uh, unique um, opportunities with OlmsteadRights.org and y'all have just been fantastic. Thanks. We're excited to see this project coming, coming, uh, getting legs and running. And I'll say my thir my last promotional statement is to go to BillMoyers.com or TalkPoverty.org for your latest um, article, which is on the ADA and Olmstead and discusses this website, which I'm very excited about. Uh, so one of the questions that I've got about this is, it looks like we're collecting a pretty good amount of data about our users, especially when we move to universal analytics. Um, is, is there anything that we should be putting either in our terms of service or in uh, explanation about our website about how a user can opt out of that process if they want to? Yeah, especially when we're dealing with a sensitive issue that's like a great disabilities. Question, uh, especially for the uh, people in the legal community. There are uh, terms of service things that Google has and says on that. Again, a lot of it, it's 
they can uh, go through their privacy on their browsers and things like that. It's probably too big of a discussion. It could probably be another seminar in terms of how do you deal with website privacy and all the different opt-out things. But uh, if you'll just look for uh, Google uh, Terms of Service for websites, uh, you'll, you can find some great sample content. But every website should have a very clear Terms of Service uh, just from a liability point of view. And then I see uh, Dave has a question in terms of develop a model to assign monetary value to goals. That's a, uh, that's a great uh, question. We have not, I mean, we've just started working with Homestead Rights on that, but that's a natural progression of where you go uh, is initially you look for goal completions as a, as a unique unit number, but as you get more uh, familiar with your objectives, uh, we have worked with some clients where we have basically uh, put in uh, monetary values for different goals. And, and you can be as very simple as, for example, on the five goals that uh, Olmstead Rights has, you could go put $5 for the most important goal, like the legal advocacy, because that's really what he's, he's trying to do. The resources uh, would be less. The emails would be more valuable. Uh, so you might give them a $3 value, a $1 value to the resources. Uh, and that just kind of helps weight your goals, if you would. And I don't think I would get too much more complicated in terms of the total dollar value uh, as opposed to allowing it to figure out whether or not you're gaining uh, overall goal value uh, between five goals that you've got set because some goals are going to be less valuable than others. There's another question in terms of thoughts on using uh, mouse trackers as part of analytics. Uh, mouse tracking is, uh, there are, uh, one of the things that Tag Manager allows you to do is you can put on some of those type of services that allow you to do mouse tracking. Uh, it, it's a lot of data. Uh, it's not that, um, uh, um, uh, we haven't seen it to be very useful uh, because most sites don't have enough traffic uh, to give it enough statistical value uh, as you would kind of see it with a, with a heat track. What I would say is there are some uh, basically page flow uh, things that exist in analytics that are very, very informative, and there are things that you can look at where you can see the percentage of people that clicked on the different buttons on a page in analytics. Uh, those are two very useful things when you look at it from a usability perspective. Uh, but one of the things I would say is, and this may be something that you can do in, in different profiles, is uh, in a lot of cases we look at Google Analytics to be used as a uh, user engagement uh, goal accomplishment uh, perspective. Uh, if you want to use analytics as a usability guide, there are certain things that you may want to do where you would put in things like mouse tracking, but you could keep those in a separate profile so they don't muddy up all the data that you're basically getting. That would be another way to approach it. We've got a question here, which is, uh, do you have a sense of the average monthly usage for statewide um, websites? I know that it, it varies a lot um, state by state. I know that uh, um, Northwest Justice Project is, is over your um, 2 million users or uh, visits uh, per year, but I, I don't know for other websites uh, if you guys have any more uh, statistics on that outside of uh, NJP. Jillian, do you have any perspective on that? I, I have not seen other statewide sites, so I don't know. Yeah, so I don't have those numbers um, in front of me, but I can certainly look and uh, see what we have in terms of the usage um, and uh, send that out through the listservs. And again, uh, one thing I would say is that just be careful when you look at average monthly usage. You can go to uh, sites uh, like SEM Rush and uh, Compete or, or different services to track at Alexa to kind of get a relative feel, but again, it really depends on how well the site is constructed, who they're targeting, uh, all of those type of things are factors. So if you start comparing yourself, if you're an orange and you start comparing to an apple, you can get yourself pretty upset pretty fast, uh, and that's where we think the goal focus is, is really the key thing. Is this site accomplishing what you want it to accomplish uh, is a much more important metric than necessarily comparing. And that's been a, a key part of Olmsted is that it is um, a, a sud, a, a definitely a subset of the population, but uh, for the people that we impact, it makes it sort of 
a, a huge impact. And it's also trying to figure out how to reach into the crevices, how to get into the nursing homes and to institutions and um, spread the word and to their families. So it's a, sort of a unique um, challenge that we have. Uh, someone uh, talks about a uh, question for good basic resource nuts and bolts and setting up and using analytics. Uh, if you go to the main Google Analytics page, there is a link uh, that uh, can take you through. Uh, Google's gotten better on, on some of their documentation on that. Uh, so that would be one place to start. The other thing is, uh, you know, there there are – if you'll just Google for that, I could pull out some resources. I don't have them uh, right in front of me, but we could, we could get that to you. Uh, the question is for pro bono not develop, net developing a way to distinguish lawyer traffic from SRL traffic at all. What I would say is that uh, one thing you can do, which is really, really one of the most powerful things within Google Analytics, is they have something called advanced segments where you can basically uh, put in criteria like whoever hit your uh, legal, advocacy, legal advocacy pages, which would be considered the lawyer pages, uh, those people you can make a, one segment and then you can say whoever uh, looked at your state resources section, uh, that's a different segment and you can compare those things and that's a really great way to tell the difference between lawyer traffic. Uh, and, and you can actually set up multiple profiles within Google Analytics that you can have one that, that only tracks those people that hit your lawyer resources pages and the others that hit the state advocacy uh, resource pages. And, and just to add a little bit, um, so it, uh, it depends on what what platform. So if this is for um, lawhelp.org, um, as as Mark mentioned, there are ways to do this in Google Analytics. Um, that it would be uh, something great to explore in the the new grant. Um, when it comes to pro bono net, um, there are again you can set up certain goals, but uh, much of the many of the pro bono net sites are actually just uh, behind a password, and so to enter in, uh, you have to distinguish yourself as either coming from civil legal ser services or other. Um, so there's there is some data on that in the general reports that we have. But as for the custom reports, uh, we're not uh, tracking that information currently. Oh, and I see um, someone just clarified they meant for the public statewide sites. Um, statewide websites. Uh, so that is, as I mentioned, uh, could be something in Google Analytics that could be set up and that there are ways to get some of that data. Yeah, and, and Janice, um, go ahead. Just follow up. So if you have like a user login uh, type of thing and that's part in, in the what's behind the uh, login is also being tracked in Google Analytics, when people hit through that and, and land past that login page, you can set those up and set up a segment that says, I only want to see people who have actually logged in, and that would be one way you could look at that. Uh, Janice has asked about the Google AdWords and um, what, what our experience with, was uh, with that. Um, Kristen Verrill, who is not able to be on today, um, was the one who got sort of the magic key and figured out how to break our issues with uh, Google AdWords. But the main issue was, that they were telling us that somebody from our organization at some time in the past had used a G, I think a Gmail, but it, just a, an email um, address to try to set up or to set up a Google AdWords account. And you can only have one account per organization. And for what they called privacy reasons, they would not tell us who that person was or what email they had used to set it up for Atlanta Legal Aid. And then there was also this issue with us being, having originally had some sort of EDU account with Google. And um, I don't think that that's going to be necessarily an issue for other people. I have heard that, the, that, the, that it can be difficult and that persistence um, sometimes pays if there's something just different about the, your application um, yeah. than a typical application. Let me, let me make one comment on that, Tally, because we, we do something here to because we manage through a lot of different accounts, and it's uh, it, it can always be tricky. What my suggestion would be is that uh, an organization 
set up a separate email address like Google dot whatever your organization's email address is or uh, AdWords or something like that that is a shared account that can be forwarded and managed and that's what you use to basically do that. The, the key I think that in, before you go through that process, once you set up that unique email, make sure you register it as a Google account. Uh, because that's when you can log in and do things and you can access uh, 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 Google Drive and other type of documents from that thing, but you're going to have to log in through that and go through that process, but that would be your master email and then obviously managing the, the password for that uh, becomes very critical for security reasons. If you give it to an individual and they leave, it, that typically becomes problematic. Uh, just to make sure people know, there, there are several links in the chat including a survey for feedback on this, uh, links to the slides, and then two different resource guides related to analytics and then also uh, to statewide uh, the toolkit. Uh, so all of those links are in your chat here and join me and we'll get those links also in our future blog post over this. I, I don't have an answer for the public survey questions. Uh, I will say that there are uh, uh, again, part of this is Google's integration, but there are a lot of there is a Google survey tool that will actually push stuff into the Google Drive and, and different things like that. That uh, those things can get integrated with a site. But I think Jillian, uh, I'm not sure how ProBono.net manages surveys on your site. Yeah, so I'm um, I. I'm, I work mostly on the ProvonoNet platform, um, so um, I could I could check in about um, lawhelp.org. I do know that um, if folks are putting some of their surveys in the widgets on the on the homepage, front and center, um, it can be helpful. It also um, the the length of the survey can have an impact on getting folks to respond in good numbers along with the kinds of questions that are asked to get actionable kind of information. Um, there's a lot of great resources on survey design. Um, but I can certainly, um, for the person who asked this, if you want to shoot me an email, um, we, can, we can talk about uh, your um, particular uh, situation and we can try to get some more information on that. Yeah, Northwest Justice Project definitely has a survey as part of the Components for Feedback on Washington Law Health, and we do get um, feedback from end users, both over resources that they're looking for and over uh, usability type stuff on the site. So it is useful. Um, excellent. Thank you guys all for um, putting this on. I greatly appreciate it. We've got a webinar coming up um, next week on expert system tools uh, and we've got a list of all of our webinars for the rest of the year up at lfntap.org slash training. That URL is in the chat. Um, I'm also going to put the survey URL in there uh, one more time. If you've got a second, please take a second and give us feedback on this uh, training. It, it's a new one that we've done, but we've uh, had a lot of interest in it. So thank you guys. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye.